screen. Okay, is this showing in full screen? Yes. Okay, great. So yeah, thanks for the invite and it's uh, great to be talking. It's great to um, well, see Bang Yi again. We met in Italy for this last conference. Um, so my name's Evan Peters. I'm a PhD student at the uh, Institute for Quantum Computing in Waterloo, Canada. And today I'm gonna to talk about uh, a recent preprint that I put out with Maria Schold, which is called Generalization Despite Overfitting in Quantum Machine Learning Models. Um, I see a chat uh, notification. If anybody has something to say, say it, because I can't see the chat. Um, so what I'm going to do is, there we go. So um, this is a high level talk, and then I'll have some more technical details near the end whole thing shouldn't be much longer than half an hour. Um, so the outline of what I want to talk about is the following. I want to start off by showing how overparameterization and therefore overfitting uh, does not preclude generalization. You can have both. I want to then show how this is kind of nice and intuitive in the four-year picture. Um, and then because we know from existing literature that you can nicely express quantum machine learning models in terms of four year series, then we're able to show how you can have generalization despite overfitting in quantum machine learning models. So the first main point here is that overparameterization can be compatible with generalization. And stepping back for a second, kind of the big idea of machine learning you're given some training data and you're trying to, sorry, could I just ask uh, people to mute their mics? So uh, you're given some training data and your goal is to kind of generalize from these uh, data um, like patterns that describe the data more generally. And an interesting observation that keeps popping up in some of the modern deep learning literature is that you can have these deep neural networks um, with billions of parameters that also seem to generalize pretty well on the data they've been given. And you know, if you have many more parameters than data points, this is maybe uh, confusing. And this comes up as you know, tension with this, there's this kind of standard idea in statistical learning, which is usually the task of generalizing can be done by reducing the complexity of your model. So you can, you can find simpler models, uh, a simpler hypothesis class to guarantee better generalization performance. And so the resolution of this tension is this idea of benign overfitting that's worked its way into machine learning literature in the last couple of years. And this just describes when you have good generalization despite perfectly overfitting the training data. So um, I wanna start by giving a, you know, a picture simple explanation of this uh, in the classical case, and then later on we'll come back and look at how this works in quantum models. So let's uh, imagine a really simple classical machine learning task. You're given some target function. In this case, it will be a straight line, and that's the dashed line you see. And then you'll sample, like, you'll sample noisy training data from this. So you'll get x, y pairs, and you know the y values are kind of uh, evaluated on this line plus additive noise. And if somebody told you that this was the setting, then you know a really reasonable thing to do would to be, say, pick the best straight line that fits this training data. And you could do, say, uh, linear regression, least squares fit, and find a straight line. And you know, in the large data limit, this will generalize optimally, and you've done a good job, and you basically learned. Uh, the underlying target function. Now, something you you don't want to do is to just find some high degree polynomial that perfectly fits these training data, get zero training error, and then say, you know, that's it. We can see that that doesn't work. Um, here's an example of how poorly that goes. And so pumping in more parameters in this case is going to give you uh, kind of a worse outcome. What we're interested in looking for is kind of a nice best of both worlds scenario where 
you have some highly parameterized model, say this green line, which is able to perfectly fit these training points, but in between those noisy data seems to agree really nicely with the underlying target function. And so that's a picture version of what benign overfitting would look like in this case. Now, um, this is this is an example of you know, linear, uh, sorry, of classical machine learning on linear data. But thinking ahead to quantum models, we know that quantum mechanics involves things like energies and, and frequencies and Hamiltonians. And so it's gonna be a lot more useful to look at this scenario through the lens of Fourier analysis. And so uh, let's kind of repeat this series of pictures and this time focus on something more Fourier friendly. This time we'll consider a simple target function and in this case, it will be simple in the sense that has a very small number of components in its Fourier series. And in this case, we'll just consider like a pure sinusoid. And once again, our goal is to try to learn this function. And this time we will sample our noisy training data and I'll add this extra restriction that we sample uh, equally spaced on the x-axis. And this has kind of a nice um, motivation from signal processing uh, standpoint. Um, you know, like you can imagine sort of like a, like, like, like Shannon interpolation sort of things, learning uh, noisy signals. Um, and I'll come back to talking more about this later on. For now, we'll just assume this for the remainder of the talk. And once again, we'll go through these, you know, this, this Goldilocks sequence. If somebody knew that they had a simple target function to fit, what they might do is pick from among all of the simple models they can come up with, the one that best describes the training data. And then this would probably be optimal um, in some statistical learning sense. And then they could also just come up with some bizarre, you know, very high degree trigonometric polynomial to fit these training data and completely miss the mark. So they've gotten zero training error, but they haven't done, they haven't done anything good. And once again, the nice in-between we're looking for is, can we find some function which um, like perfectly fits these training points and then also seems to agree really nicely with the, uh, the target function in between those training data. So to put into math some of the words that I've said so far, I've been talking about a simple target function. And here I mean a function that has a, a Fourier series and um, its Fourier coefficients, which are these g hats k, are associated with these Fourier basis functions, e to the i kx. And it only has like a small number of non-zero coefficients. So this set omega n naught, it's like a small set. And then the sampling restriction I talked about before is just, we have these, call them labels, and they are this target function evaluated at evenly spaced points x in an additive noise. So then what kind of model are we interested in using to fit these data? In this case, we're going to look at a model um, that looks like this. And it once again has the form of a Fourier series but I've broken the Fourier coefficients into two different parts. The first part, uh, these alpha Ks, these will be the trainable coefficients. These are what we will optimize during the training. Uh, and now I've added this second set of coefficients, which I'll call the feature weights, new k, excuse me. And these, we're going to fix these at the onset of training. And, it, or from another perspective, we're going to use these to kind of specify the class of functions that we're going to, uh, to optimize over. And one way to motivate this is there's a lot of different ways you could approach coming up with a, a trigonometric polynomial, like a Fourier series of this form. And specifying these feature weights in UK, it imposes a kind of inductive bias on the model. It kind of, it kind of pushes the model towards some functions over others. And an example might be I could pick feature weights that would more effectively like restrict the uh, spectrum of this function. They would prefer some frequencies over other frequencies in this Fourier series. And so speaking of the spectrum, uh, this model will have access to frequencies in this omega d. And we're going to say that this omega d strictly contains 
the spectrum of the target function we're trying to learn. And this is the sense in which I call this model overparameterized. It has strictly more Fourier basis functions than it needs in order to learn that target function G that I showed earlier. So now that we have the model, we want to train it. And the, the optimization I'm going to apply to this model is the following. We're going to require that you know, our optimal model perfectly fits the training data. And that's mainly because we're interested in benign overfitting. So we're just looking at models that perfectly overfit the data. And then among all of those models, we're going to regularize and find the, uh, like the simplest model from that set. And in this case, regularization means minimizing the, the L2 norm of this vector of trainable coefficients. Um, and then that minimization is subject to that, uh, the function f perfectly fitting your training data. So let's look at a couple of extreme examples of training this model. In this first example on the left, we're going to consider a model, like sorry, a target function g, which is identically zero. And so in that case, you sample these points, uh, the black points, and those are just noise. And then we train our model and ask, you know, how well does it perform on this target function? Well, because the target function is identically zero, you're looking for a model which is close to zero everywhere, but it has this restriction that has to perfectly fit those training points. And so the, you know, the extremes that we see are, if we restrict our model, the, the thing that we're training, to have a really small bandwidth, uh, we'll perfectly fit these training points, but in this like, very smeared out kind of way, the model is like really perturbed away from zero because it can't effectively um, like get close to zero while also fitting those training data. Uh, conversely, if we let the model have really large bandwidth, have access to a really large number of frequencies, then we'll get something that looks like this blue line. And here the model is basically, it's basically zero everywhere, except for where those noisy points were given. And then it kind of spikes up locally to you know, agree with the training data at that point and then goes back down to zero. And from a, uh, like from a Fourier lens, this inset shows kind of the distribution of Fourier coefficients for the trained model. And because we were given noise, we have sort of this uniform-ish distribution of Fourier coefficients for the, uh, called the target function. I mean, the target function is zero. But um, in the case where you have a small bandwidth, you have to like learn that set of noise coefficients, Fourier coefficients, using only a small number of frequencies. And then you end up having like a large L2 norm uh, in Fourier space. But as you give yourself more frequencies to work with, you can spread out that L2 norm into this higher frequency space. And because the L2 norm is exactly the error, uh, you'll be able to decrease the error of the function. So then uh, the other extreme example is what if there's no noise whatsoever? Um, so in this case, you can see a dashed line here and that's the target function and sampled from perfectly. And this time, when you have a small bandwidth model trying to learn this, interpolating those data points means uh, like perfectly learning the underlying target function. So in this case, we very effectively restricted this, uh, this model in red, which is underneath the dashed line in such a way that perfectly learns that model and it's kind of the best choice you could have made. And Conversely, if you allow your model now to have a larger spectrum, a larger number of frequencies as access to, it just makes the model look like garbage. So now it's doing kind of the same thing as it was doing before, um, which is being close to zero and then just jumping around wherever it was given training data. Um, now, both of these cases were when we fixed the feature weights uh, to be constants, I should have said earlier. So this was where if those feature weights nu k are just you know, uniform, like uniformly distributed over the spectrum of the model. And now what we're going to do is we're going to reintroduce interesting feature weights and see what changes about these, these fitting behaviors. Um, so in particular, we're going to like realize this benign overfitting phenomenon by tuning these feature weights. And I'm going to pick this simple example where 
we'll pick those feature weights nu k to be large and constant uh, for frequencies that are in the spectrum of the target function, and then small but non-zero everywhere else in the model's spectrum. Um, so it's kind of biasing the model that we're training towards frequencies that the target function will have. And if we do this, um, we can fix a number of training data. And as we increase the dimensionality of the model we're using, we'll get better and better testing error. Um, and always will get perfect fitting because that was a requirement of our training. And then this isn't quite generalization because uh, this is if you fix the number of data. So now what we'll do is we'll increase the number of data. Um, but as we do this, we have to increase D, the dimensionality of our model, in order to stay in the overparametrized regime to make sure we have you know, strictly more dimensions in our model than there are data points. Um, and if we do this, then we'll see um, this benign overfitting behavior, which is the test error or the <clears throat> excuse me generalization error of the model is going to vanish in the large n limit, um, provided that we're scaling d large enough, you know, strictly greater than n. So this is what the benign overfitting looks like in a classical free picture. And now I want to briefly review existing literature that says that we can have quantum machine learning models that are expressed in exactly that kind of Fourier picture. So let's think of a, a circuit model variational quantum algorithm. And um, this in this model, we'll have these lines representing qubits. And we'll specify that we have kind of a shallow circuit uh, shallow in the sense that it only has one layer um, where the unitary is dependent on the data x. So we have this u, which could be arbitrarily deep, but as otherwise you know, we're allowing it to take on kind of any unitary. And then we'll have this data encoding unitary s of x, and then we'll compute the expectation value of some uh, Hermitian operator m. And I will throw away all of those extra wires and we'll consider generic d-dimensional systems. So it's a little uh, slash will mean. And I'll take that arbitrary unitary and combine it with this, um, this zero state, and I'll call that the input state. And that's this uh, gamma ket, and it has amplitudes that are given by little gamma. So uh, once we have the input state, I'll also specify that the, the way that we encode the data into this quantum circuit is using a diagonal unitary. Um, and so this S of X it is diagonal and it has these, uh, like it's generated by a Hamiltonian, uh, which has eigenvalues lambda one through lambda D. And then we encode this, excuse me, we encode X into this exponential and we're just looking at um, encoding X and no, no kind of nonlinear functions of X. It's just, uh, we, we don't want to hide any of the model's capacity into pre-processing on X. So we just, introduce the training data as uh, like a linear dependency. So then we compute the model as the output of this uh, circuit. And you can write that, um, like you can write the expectation value of that um, Hermitian operator like this. And then using those parts I showed before, you can quickly expand that into this equation. And then um, I'll highlight in this equation, like this difference of eigenvalues of the, the, the Hamiltonian that we use to encode the data. And if we take those differences in eigenvalues and fix them to be uh, like that difference to be some constant k, then we can split the sum into summing over all of the different k's and then summing over all of the indices in our system where the difference of eigenvalues contributes to that k. And that k turns out to be a frequency. And so now we have something that looks a lot more like a Fourier series. We have a sum of Fourier basis functions, and then we have this particularly simple Fourier coefficient for the model I've chosen. Um, and I'll rewrite this set of indices that differ um, in eigenvalue by k as this R of k. So now we have Fourier series with Fourier coefficients on the right. Now, we're going to use this as the, the, the quantum model, but we haven't quite gotten into the form that we had before. We don't have those feature weights nu k and those trainable coefficients alpha. Uh, 
Uh, so let's uh, let's keep going until we get there. If we train this model in the same spirit as we train the classical model, that is, we require the model to perfectly interpolate the training data, and then among all of the quantum models that do so, we regularize to find the simplest model. Um, and here, we do regularization in basically the same way as we did before, where we're going to regularize the observable and you know, look for a minimum Frobenius norm or L2 norm. Like if we run this analogous training program on the quantum model, it turns out that those feature weights that I introduced earlier that control the bias of the model, they reappear in the optimized quantum model. So I haven't shown the optimized quantum model on the page here. It's kind of, um, it's, it's too much to look at, but you can trust me that if you look at it and you compare it to the optimal classical model, you have a one-to-one -one correspondence between the classical feature weights nu k and this quantity here, which is nu k opt. And um, this nu k opt depends on the way that we encoded the data, uh, this sort of combinatorial property of the Hamiltonian, this R of k set. And it also depends on those, uh, the input states of the model. So those are the two ways that we can now tune the inductive bias of our model and look for a benign overfitting. So let's look at an example where we uh, simplify it and we fix the input state. So now I'll fix the input state to be this uniform superposition. And you can imagine if I had Q qubits and D is you know, T to the Q, I'll just have some wall of Hadamards acting on each qubit. And if I do this now, there's only one way I can tune those feature weights and that's by changing the, the data encoding unitary S of X. So then you can imagine all sorts of ways that you want to encode data into this quantum model. Um, here I'll show just like two that are particularly interesting. One of them, which is um, you know, popular and maybe obvious is uh, in this green box, you could imagine having a bunch of local road. Is that a question? Oh, okay, sorry. Um, you see, so you can imagine having like a bunch of local rotations by the data X, and this would just kind of like, you know, it's sort of like the, the straightforward approach. I'm going to rotate like qubits by some amount proportional to X. Uh, but you can also play around with prefactors on, um, on these Xs, which is another way of saying playing around with the spectrum of that Hamiltonian that encodes the data. And in this case, there's this uh, like kind of nice combinatorial way to encode those uh, with these prefactors that grow exponentially. And these are just two examples of like an infinite number of possibilities. Once we pick that way to encode our data into the quantum model, we can look at the basically the inductive bias of that model, uh, the feature weights that appear in the optimized model. And in the case in the green box, we end up with feature weights that are really heavily concentrated on a small number of frequencies. And I mean, like this is a log scale, so it's even more concentrated than it looks. There's only a couple of frequencies in this model that have like any, uh, you know, uh, like uh, any non-negligible Fourier coefficient associated with them. Um, conversely, when we use this red encoding that I introduced, you end up with this much kind of flatter distribution of these feature weights, which says that this model is going to incorporate frequencies uh, from a much broader spectrum than the first one did. Uh, and then this purple line is another one which I won't show. Uh, and this is sort of like the flattest possible way you can um, like encode, sorry, like the flattest possible uh, set of feature weights you can get in like the largest possible spectrum of a, a model like this. Um, and it's a very interesting example of saying like, what is the biggest possible spectrum I can pump into uh, like a, a quantum model? Uh, so regardless, we have these uh, feature weights specified, and now we want to you know, train these models on some data. So I will take a target function, and it's a simple sinusoid as before, and I'll sample kind of noisy training points. And then depending on which one of these uh, data encoding strategies I use, I'll get very different fitting behavior. And in this case, the, you know, the, the green model, which is kind of heavily concentrated, in the spectrum, it's kind of smoothly interpolating the training points, whereas this very flat distribution of feature weights is ending up with a very flat function and it's very spiky in interpolating the noisy training data. 
and is otherwise basically uh, equal to some constant. And this, this kind of mimics that pair of extremes that I showed earlier in the classical case. And so just like in the classical case, the way to you know, move between those two extremes to find like a best of both worlds scenario, we're now going to reintroduce an input state to these models to find something that fits these training data uh, that's a nice happy medium between these two extremes that we're seeing. So we've assembled all of these pieces and now it just remains to be shown, uh, how can you get generalization despite overfitting in a quantum machine learning model? So to do this, like I said, we reintroduce a, a non-trivial input state to this model. And um, I'll pick from kind of one of two different input states. I'll have this red state, which is the same as it was before, just a uniform superposition. And it doesn't really induce an interesting bias into your model. And then I'll pick a blue state, which isn't shown, but it is such that induces a set of feature weights that are um, very concentrated in a band. And in particular, they're concentrated in this gray region, which exactly corresponds to the set of frequencies that are present in the target function. And so we're really mimicking the example I showed before. We're picking a state that induces feature weights that are like heavily concentrated um, in the spectrum of the target function. So now what happens when we train this model? Uh, I'll have once again a like, simple target function and we'll do noisy sampling. And now when we use this model that has the blue input state, um, this will roughly fit the character of the underlying target function, the dashed line, but very you know, spiky behavior near the training points. It jumps around in order to interpolate the training points, but as sort of a secondary effect to mainly focusing on fitting the target function. And this makes sense. We sort of nudged the model towards this exact behavior. And um, an interesting kind of comparison you can draw between like looking at this picture and looking at the feature weights as a function of frequency, um, you see that the overall trend of the function is mostly due to the feature weights uh, whose frequencies align with the target function. And then the spiky interpolating behavior is like it's captured by this long tail of feature weights that stretch off into higher and higher frequencies. And so we're kind of saying to get this benign overfitting, uh, you want some frequencies that are really preferred with like a pretty strong concentration of your feature weights in that band. And then you want a lot of frequencies that have kind of a, a long tail uh, associated with the like higher and higher frequencies. And those higher frequency modes are used to interpolate this data or end up interpolating this data. And then just to you know prove that what we're doing here is kind of uh, optimal in some sense, if you increase the number of training points, uh, this picture here is for just a fixed number, if we keep adding more and more training data and we keep increasing the dimensionality of the model uh, to be strictly lower bounded by that number of data, then what we will get is vanishing generalization error in the uh, large uh, N limit. So, and that's, that's good generalization. And this is all contingent on having perfectly overfit the training data. So um, that concludes kind of the high level part of this talk, which is you know, the four main points. You can have over uh, excuse me, you can have over parameterization and generalization, or you can have over or overfitting plus generalization, and that you can kind of show this nicely in a Fourier picture. And then since we, we know that quantum models can be expressed nicely as Fourier series, then we can combine all these pieces to get generalization despite overfitting in quantum machine learning. Um, so that kind of concludes the first part of this talk. Uh, <clears throat> the associated preprint is here. Here's the archive identifier, um, hard to miss on the slide. Um, maybe I'll take questions now and then I can close out the rest of the time with um, like an additional theory oriented set of slides. Um, so thank you. Yeah, thanks, Ivan, for the nice, interesting uh, overview of your work. Yeah. So, uh, anyone have any questions uh, for now?
or maybe while people are thinking of the question, if I could like uh, ask ask a question first. Uh, now you have now that you have been have shown uh quantum machine learning models with uh, a typical rotational basis and coding uh methods could lead to uh overfitting, but then it's still generalized because of the penal overfitting, right? What uh over here what you have shown is just um uh, that okay quantum model is just doing as well uh just this as well uh with the classical model so I just want to ask like what uh in this sense like what quantum can do more right so the question is where's the quantum advantage not necessarily advantage per se but what kind of um and then because okay yeah you can say that it's quantum advantage but it's not necessary in terms of time but then mm -hmm. the, the, uh, other aspect uh yeah, yeah. so yeah, um, it's an important question. Um, it, it's really important, and I also don't have a great answer because it kept coming up in the process of this work. I think there's this there's this vague notion that you can have um, you can maybe have some kind of power coming from these quantum models where if you have like a really large spectrum, um, then like, somehow the size of that spectrum being like exponential in the number of qubits gives you like like some sort of capacity edge on like comparable classical models. Um, I, I haven't really written anything specifically on this, but I wanna argue that that's probably not an obvious uh, takeaway. So like, I do have like one backup slide that talks about this. Uh, so the idea is like, can I have a really large spectrum and maybe that would give me some kind of advantage? And first off, I want to point to, um, there's a ton of literature already that talks about uh, random Fourier features. I think your talk next week is going to be just that. And random Fourier features are this idea where if you know that you have a, a Fourier series as your model, and if you know the Fourier coefficients associated with that Fourier series, then you can sort of just you can sort of do classical Monte Carlo sampling on those Fourier coefficients to get this kind of like this Monte Carlo version of that Fourier series that performs really closely to the original one because you know whatever set of Fourier coefficients that you had that were really small in some high frequency spaceland turn out not to be important because they don't get sampled much um, and. I want to maybe add like an extra nuance to this uh, analysis then. So if you knew all of the parts of your quantum model, like if the classical learner knew all those parts, they'd be, it'd be very easy for them to just reproduce the output of the quantum circuit. They would just do this random for your feature sampling. So what if we made it harder for the classical model by like, like not telling it what the output measurement was? And this is just an example I'm doing because the analysis is uh, on the slide. So like maybe like we could say, uh, oh, the quantum model, like if the classical learner doesn't know the uh, observable, then we can sample from this thing in the classical learner. If we make it try to learn what the observable was from like the Fourier sampling, then it would have a really hard time. Um, I would argue that this would be also hard for the quantum model. And an example of this is if we were to take, um, if we take like the specific data encoding strategy where every Fourier coefficient of the quantum model is associated with just a single element of the uh, output observable, then in order to get a really large, interesting output from this quantum uh, circuit, like to get a rich quantum model with a large spectrum, we have to be, uh, estimating parts of an observable that's uh, very dense, which probably has a very large norm. So like we need exponentially many non-trivial parts of these Fourier coefficients that I've written here. And for that to be true, we need an observable that has a lot of non-zero coefficients everywhere. Um, but if you require this, then you're making the task very hard for a quantum computer as well. Um, I, I think intuitively it's really hard to sample you know, from an observable that is like a very large norm or is very uh, is very dense, um, unless you make some interesting restrictions, say about like locality, and then you can maybe use shadows or whatever. But uh, the reasoning is just because the quantum model has a large spectrum, 
um, this doesn't make it easy for classical, or sorry, it doesn't make it hard for a classical model to sample from. And what's more is it doesn't even make it easy for the quantum model to sample from. A lot of these models might end up being intractable to actually uh, estimate at the output of the quantum circuit. Does that make some sense? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I think there's still a lot of more work need to be done in this area in order to... Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, so we have one more question. Uh, like, which one controls the generalization, the input, uh, input state, gamma, uh, the encoding part, or both? Both. So, um, in this case, in this final slide I showed, we have this input state that we tuned um, as like a refinement of the feature weights that were induced by this data encoding Hamiltonian S of X. So the S of X here is, it's the same S of X that's in the red box here. So the original feature weights start out with this, um, this distribution in red, which is actually linear if you look at it on the linear scale. And then we're able to shape those and tune them much more finely by controlling the input state. And so, I mean, this arises out of, I mean, it's kind of a challenge to come up with these data encoding uh, unitaries, S of X, where you have a nice closed form expression for the uh, set of feature weights that they give you. And it was the set of feature weights that you wanted. Um, so it's kind of harder to play with those. It's all kind of combinatorics. And so what you do is you find, um, what we did is we found like a good enough feature weights that were induced by the encoding strategy. And then we fine tune those by playing around with the input state. Um, and I should emphasize, and this is another, um, I think it's like another interesting uh, thing about quantum models is you can't do that much with the input state. Uh, it's really restricted by where you started with. Uh, and by that, I mean where like the where the feature weight distribution uh, is for the data encoding. Um, and for example, if I were to use the data encoding strategy that gives me this flat set of feature weights in purple, it turns out that I can't really change that to be much more than flat by changing the input state. Like I can get for like a small, like for a small number of frequencies, I can get some interesting shaping, but once I add more and more frequencies, no matter what the input state is, your set of feature weights basically looks flat. And so in this way, both of these things are really important for controlling kind of the inductive bias of the model. And you have to like trade off the fine tuning and the coarse graining. I see. Yeah, it's kind of, uh... okay. So, um, so actually <laughs> like here, you kind of mentioned that, um, uh, you are encoding the inductive bias by uh, changing uh, the input state and the data encoding part, right? Do you have a general guidance on how to uh, kind of set the inductive bias or maybe the bandwidth or uh, or, or some other related uh, kind of parameters uh, based on the data at hand? Because like, uh, yeah. never, because like we know like uh, now that we have geometrical quantum machine learning that when we know there's a rotational symmetry, then we can use that information to kind of construct the circuit um, for the data set, right? Do you have any guidance on how to construct such a circuit for your, for your setup? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, and that's a great point with the geometrical machine learning. So uh, if you use, for example, if you use this data encoding strategy in the green box that gives you this like really small spectrum that's not just small, but it's like highly concentrated on like the smallest frequencies. Um, if you use this, it turns out that um, like this is also a popular example in geometrical machine learning. This thing has a lot of input states uh, like invariances. So not only is it a small spectrum, but you also can't do that much fine tuning with the input states. And I, I write this out more clearly in the paper, but basic idea was not only do you have this okay so like here's a maybe here's a proposal so suppose someone says uh you you can pick a data encoding hamiltonian and the smaller the spectrum is corresponding to that encoding the more like control you will have 
over the Fourier coefficients associated with that spectrum. And conversely, if you do something with like this purple um, set of feature weights, where you have a very large spectrum, you'll have very little control over um, your, your Fourier coefficients. Now, I've already said that that second part <clears throat> is true. Like you can, you can kind of show that like, if you have this really large spectrum with, that is induced by these flat feature weights, you can't really get interesting Fourier coefficients anymore um, unless most of them are zero. But the first thing I said is not true. Like the converse doesn't hold. Even with this small, like this set of feature weights that has a small spectrum, you don't have very much control over those Fourier coefficients either. And that comes out of this geometrical machine learning uh, part, which is the input states, like there's, uh, there's like invariance classes of those input states where any set of input states up to a unitary applied on it gives you exactly the same feature weights. So it's not good enough to say, oh, I've made my, like my models are all equally expressive and some have large spectra and some have smaller spectra and they make up for it by better Fourier coefficients. No, like you can have a small spectrum and really bad control over the Fourier coefficients. Um, so the advice uh, for finding like a rich spectrum is um, you want to go, like you have to go and look at the combinatorics. Uh, like you have this Hamiltonian that induces this spectrum and you want to play around with these prefactors. Uh, but like your goal should probably be like something that's not exponentially large or isn't that large of an exponent in the spectrum, but something that's bigger than this like linearly sized spectrum. And you do this by messing around with the like the diagonals of the Hamiltonian that you encoded your data with. Uh, and by like picking those diagonals such that their differences tend to be unique. Um, but I can't give much like better advice than this because uh, I, I don't know if it's, uh, I don't know if we understand this yet. Okay. Um, so we have one more question here. After this question, maybe we can more move the more technical part and then we can uh, shut up all the questions mm -hmm. to you uh, after you, uh, you, you finish uh, the technical part. Um, so like, uh, so this, so he, so, so that we have one question about uh, the. Okay, so so you kind of regular, so so you control the, uh, the generalizations by regularizing the frequency domain, uh, in the quantum circuits, right? Then does this method works uh the same rule even if it is used as a regularization layers in hybrid models with conventional deep learning layers? I didn't really understand this question. Like, um, would uh, Jung Yong, do you want to uh, uh speak out to Eva elaborate more on your questions? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh hello. I'm uh, I'm Jung Yong Lee from Korea, and uh, I have uh, it, actually it is very simple question. Uh, uh I I use you know, these days I studied about uh. A hybrid model, which is a conventional deep learning model with a simple circuit, a quantum circuit, then uh, we can uh, make a quantum circuit layer as like this uh, red dot region, like uh, Rx, X, Rx, 2X. Then uh, I think that layer works as a, a frequency domain regularization uh, layer for a uh, hybrid model, which is uh, connected with conventional deep learning model with the uh, uh, quantum circuits. So the uh, my question is then, uh, uh, if we use like the red dot region quantum circuit in hybrid model, then uh, we can get the same uh, frequency domain regularization uh, 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 by this, uh, only using by this method, it, it, it's my uh, question. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's an interesting idea. Um, I, I guess I have to come clean and say, I don't, I don't study uh, hybrid models very much. So I don't know how like the regularization and the quantum part would 
like interact with the classical part. Um, yeah, I don't know if I can give you uh, an educated guess, but like it's an interesting idea to combine it and to use this as some sort of like, like, like not pre-processing step, but some like link in a chain where you're doing learning. Um, it could be like some kind of like specialized frequency domain module of some kind, but I don't know what that would look like. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think we can have more question now. Maybe uh, you find you can put it on if you open this up. Yeah. Okay, cool. So um, I wanted to add uh, some spicier mathematics because I, I think it can be useful to like think about um, uh, think about these things from a more um, like a more unified framework. So I'll, I'll approach this part in the form of a, a Q and A. Um, which is maybe um, like maybe critically pointing out parts of the work that we could have done differently but didn't. So, like the first question you might ask is these feature weights nu k. Um, I somehow like I, I said that these were a way of tuning the inductive bias, which is perfectly valid. But like, why did we need to include those in the model to do this study? And the answer here turns out to be. Um, because we required uniform spacing on the input data. And here's what that looks like. So first imagine this map phi, um, which I'll call like a, a Fourier features map, which sends our input data X to some vector. And each, like, each component of this vector is a Fourier basis function whose Fourier coefficient is this feature weight nu k I've been talking about. So, okay, fine, we have these phi's. And then there are these function valued vectors. And then if you take all of those phi's in your training data and computes what's called the, which is this expectation value that I give here in the second equality, um, this is describing the covariance between elements of these Fourier features. If you do this covariance matrix calculation using the uniform spacing property on the data that we've used, then it turns out that the covariance matrix associated with our feature vectors uh, is A, diagonal, and B, has the feature weights that I introduced on the diagonal. And what, like, this is, uh, this is profound because the covariance matrix of these feature vectors is sort of what controls generalization properties of your model. Just like a covariance matrix in linear regression is what describes the distribution of data that you're going to fit with a line. Uh, the distribution of these feature vectors describes the data we're trying to learn. And in this case, or sorry, the, the model that we're learning with. And in this case, we've chosen a distribution of X such that these features are uh, like already diagonal in feature space. And so if you're, uh, for people who are interested in like, uh, like kernel, uh, perspectives like RKHS, you can imagine we have an RKHS that we've like enforced to have already be diagonalized with respect to these uh, embeddings phi, um, and the you know the integral kernel operator here is diagonalized, and we know its spectrum. And then if you do something say like kernel target alignment, where your goal is to take the eigenfunctions of your model class and align those. Uh, with the eigenfunctions of the like the class of target function you're trying to fit, then like the kernel target alignment process becomes really straightforward because we already diagonalized our covariance matrix. So, in in like a sentence, um, picking this uniform spacing diagonalizes uh, our model in some sense that makes it much easier to describe generalization behavior. Uh, and the generalization behavior is strictly related to the spectral properties of this covariance matrix I've introduced. And therefore, in our case, when we've eliminated the dependence of the input data X, the benign overfitting, which is a generalization behavior, depends entirely on those feature weights nu k because those are the spectrum of the induced covariance matrix. So yeah, we've now shifted into a picture where we're imagining like aligning a set of eigenfunctions that our model has access to, to a set of basis functions that our target function is composed of. 
done by adjusting the corresponding eigenvalues for the eigenfunctions in our model class to be nicely distributed with the uh, coefficients of the basis functions of the target function. Um, and then this is exactly the same argument. We move to the quantum case. So now I will uh, describe a map, which is uh, instead of phi, I'll call it psi. And this sends x to not just the encoded state rho of x. And remember, rho of x is the density matrix for like um, the states that gets uh, measured at the end of the circuit. So we'll vectorize that first, and then we'll define our covariance matrix as the kind of the true average of vectorizations of our encoded data. Um, because we have the uniform data, uh, we can pull kind of the same trick as the previous slide. I can rewrite this integral um, uh, in terms of like a set of roots of identities, and then all of the off-diagonal components of this covariance operator that I've just defined disappear. And we get uh, the covariance operator equal to this last line. Um, but we can just eyeball this and see that's already in its, you know, it's, it's a positive operator that's in its spectral decomposition. And we can just read the eigenvalues off of this uh, summation just by normalization. Um, and so in the quantum case, with this uniform data spacing, we have the exact same uh, like system as we had on the previous slide. And this time I'm showing that the new K opt like those, um, like those optimized uh, feature weights, those turn out to be the, uh, like, again, the spectrum of a covariance matrix. And this time it's in like quantum state space. Um, and then there's like an interesting like coincidence here between these are both the spectrum of that, uh, of that covariance operator and the, you know, the things that solve the L2, minim uh, L2 norm minimization problem. And I think, uh, you know, like a glance at you know, standard kernel theory tells us, yes, we actually expect that, it turns out. So that tells us why, uh, theoretically, it was really useful to do uniform spacing. But now let's suppose we want to incorporate X dependence into this analysis, which is, to me, a really interesting question, but uh, well, we'll see it has some challenges. So if we switch from uh, uniformly spaced input data to taking x, you know, independently, identically distributed according to some distribution, which is, you know, what we usually do in machine learning. Uh, what happens is we now have off-diagonal components in that uh, covariance matrix that I was describing before. So now we don't have this nicely diagonalized matrix, and more importantly, the feature weights that we choose for the quantum model no longer coincide with the spectrum of the covariance matrix for this problem. Um, indeed, the spectrum of this covariance matrix is the uh, like it's the it's the eigenvalues of some random matrix whose elements are these uh, elements of those Fourier feature vectors I introduced before. Um, this is this sorry this is missing a coefficient of like nu k. Uh, so then, um, once you've done that, we have another problem, which is. Uh, in this case, now we have to care a lot about finite sample uh, approximations. So while there exists a covariance matrix uh, that is you know, defined with respect to the underlying data distribution, we only ever have access to a covariance matrix that is you know, empirically observed. And this is sort of like, a, like an N sample estimate to the covariance matrix we're interested in. And so then the tool that we would need to go forward is some kind of concentration argument that says this finite uh, approximation of the covariance matrix that we're interested in is converging nicely towards the eigenvalues of the covariance matrix that we want. And I, I think this literature exists out there. I, I, I'm sure of it, but one will have to dig this up and kind of massage things. Uh, once we have these parts, then we plug those back into the kind of analysis that is typically done in benign overfitting, which I would direct people to. Um, like Bartlett's paper is an awesome example of this. Um, and you can sort of then argue that if your feature weights and your data distribution have this nice uh, you know, behavior that plays well together, then you'll get this benign overfitting. Uh, but I wanna emphasize um, on this next slide that 
I think the the outcome of that process should be in spirit really similar to what we've shown here. Um, and so in other words, in the case that we use to show benign overfitting, we incorporated knowledge of the spectrum of the target function into our uh, analysis. And you might think this is cheating because if you knew that spectrum to begin with, you should have just defined a you know Fourier series that was uh, composed only with those frequencies and you have kind of like, you, you can prove you know, statistical optimality. Uh, but, okay, so like, let's say we get a statement of this following form by doing all the analysis I just talked about where we incorporate the data dependence and the feature weights. We get a statement that's like, if we don't know n naught and we implement a model where it's uh, the dimension is much larger than the number of data and that's much larger than the spectrum of the underlying target function, then we will have that degeneralization or goes to zero if our sequence nu k and the data distribution have such and such properties. Um, but it turns out that those properties you're interested in look a lot like the uh, examples that I've shown already in this presentation. Um, and so this has been done before in the case of linear regression again in Bartlett's paper, and without going into too much detail about the distribution of uh, you know, feature weights, they call them something different, it still needs to look like something that's heavily concentrated for small uh, frequencies. And this time frequency doesn't just mean Fourier basis, it can mean really any orthonormal basis on L2. You need this concentration on the low frequencies and then this long tail of, um, of uh, feature weights for larger frequencies, and that long tail is kind of vanishing, but not too fast. And that long tail allows your model to perfectly fit the noise, whereas this nice concentration property, you know, this exponential decay, concentrating on the low frequencies means that your model mostly prefers to learn the, the important parts of the underlying function. And that target function, the important part are the frequencies that were in this omega n naught. And so this is a much fancier and rigorous, of course, uh, but fancier way of kind of approaching the problem to get the same looking distribution that we ended up with. Um, so yeah, that's kind of a, like a big mathematical primer on like the spectral kinds of analyses that go into this problem. Uh, but I'll just say that we steered away from those mostly in the current preprint um, and hopefully in the future, we can pick back up and find a more robust analysis that gets rid of some of the assumptions. Um, so now that's uh, now that's really the end of the talk and I can take the final questions. Right, yeah. So yeah, actually before like, you go into a thing, I was uh, having a technical questions like mm -hmm. about the RKSS one. Yeah, because currently yeah, yeah. I'm also working on like RKSS and, uh, and uh, like basically, like here you define the feature map based on uh the kind of like uh all the uh frequency terms, right? And then um uh, then uh then you, uh, here here you show nicely that um all the like new basically correspond to the eigenvalues of uh of these like covariant matrices, and then it's like if you do the central trick, basically you can see that. Uh, all these eigenvalues go into the denominators of your uh, regularization terms and it's somehow like show show a, a way to encode the inductive bias. So, yeah, these were mm -hmm. the questions that I was planning to ask, but then you already kind of answered my questions. And uh, actually, I have some some, some some kind of like things to discuss on this RKSS, but uh, let's uh, put it offline. Uh, maybe sure. we can like, uh, have like... Uh, have other people asked some questions? Like, has anyone have any questions uh, before we uh, let Ivan go? If not, then I will ask uh, last, um, last final questions. Because over here, you have uh, considered the noiseless case, right? What do you think like uh, noise will come into effect? Uh, Models like for example the uh sampling noise because over here you just assume everything's kind of perfect sampling you can of course mm -hmm. get, you can get the model like perfectly right but then let alone all the incoherent noise and and what like what uh the what will 
uh, the sensing noise does to your model. We will kind That's of really wash, yeah, we will wash away the higher frequency term and then all the benign overfitting that relies on this higher frequency term will go, go away or what? Because, uh, I, because like, um, in my, like, it, for my, for my understanding, it seems to be that if you have sampling noise, then, uh, there are some high frequency terms that you couldn't like captures and like when you consider, uh, imperfect models, then you'll be able, uh, you, you kind of like watch all the high frequency terms and this, yeah, been overfitting stuff, you, you, uh, go away, right? Okay. So, okay. Um, yeah, that's okay. That's a really good question. Um, because yeah, not only is this analysis thinking about fault tolerant quantum computers with arbitrary uh, measurements, which is a stretch, but we're also neglecting the uh, finite sampling error. Um, I don't. So I don't have a, a verifiable answer for you, but. My hunch is actually that it won't have as bad of an effect as you're describing. And the reason for this is that the tail of these feature weights that we've imposed, we already set it to be small, right? We already chose those feature weights to be like to be present, but not have a big impact on the fitting behavior of the model. Mm -hmm. um, now, what that might mean in practice is that it's really hard to actually sample a model that like actually overfits the like what's probably going to happen is you don't have the exact mixture of frequencies to like perfectly interpolate these points in this way because it's a very uh, fragile combination of Fourier modes uh, basis functions. But um, I think what would end up happening is rather you would get something that looks almost identical to this plot except those sharp spikes are just duller, uh, which reflects having um, less kind of fine control over the small high frequency uh, feature weights. So it would sort of be describing a different phenomenon, right? You wouldn't really be able to overfit the data, but you'd have this function which is getting really close to overfitting the data, but as long as that set of feature weights that's small is you know, suppressed enough, but not too much, you're still going to have something that's learning the underlying function kind of the right way. Um, but yeah, no, I, I saw like a, there was analysis uh, on the archive, I think a week back that looked at just this kind of question. Uh, so that's a really good sort of analysis to be thinking about incorporating into these things. Right. Okay. Um, now it's already- uh, oh, I think we have oh, another question. Yeah, we have so another question. So uh, I think it's after this question that we'll just like, wrap up everything. For sure. Yeah. So uh, this is the questions uh, regarding the binary overfitting in general. It seems you, it seems like you still need to tune uh, to reach low test uh, loss. That doesn't seem to exhibit a significant advantage over the classical regime. Oh, oh, of course. Like there's, um, there's no sort of claim that we're doing something better than the classical version in this work. What we are, so like the gist of what we're trying to understand better is we have these quantum models uh, that people are becoming interested in. I, I say quantum model, people say variational quantum algorithm, variational quantum circuits and so on. Like people are becoming interested in them. And one of the, one of the interesting things you can do with them is you can, you can induce a huge spectrum in these models kind of with trivial uh, like manipulation of qubits. Like, again, like there's this red encoding scheme here where this, this is a trigonometric polynomial, polynomial whose spectrum grows exponentially with the number of qubits. And it seems like something really powerful, but then you might turn around and ask, well, aren't functions in the real world, like, is it really, is it really necessary to have a large number of frequencies? In fact, when having a really large number of frequencies hurt your performance because we expect kind of low frequency behavior in the real world. And that's the thing we were trying to probe with this analysis. And basically the answer was you can use these very large, uh, like very large frequency models, sorry, very large spectrum models, provided that the spectrum has like a, a kind of inductive bias associated with it that decays in a favorable way. And favorable is really 
you know, tuned to the analysis that we did. But it's, it's basically saying like, yeah, you can go ahead and use these really large spectrum models to maybe try to fit classical data. Um, and it won't necessarily destroy your performance because the higher frequencies that this model has access to might not be doing something that's fundamentally harmful. They might just be benignly overfitting the data. Um, and furthermore, this is like a kind of a different spin on overparameterization than I think is usually talked about in the quantum literature. Uh, I think a lot of people are interested in sort of, uh, there's, there's different definitions of overparameterization that people have looked at. And here we've tried to explore a definition and the um, like consequences of that definition from a different perspective. But in no way do I think that this is a, a call to arms to use this analysis to start beating classical uh, models. I don't think that follows. Okay, yeah, so uh, now we have all question answered. Uh, I think so, like, if you guys have any uh, question about this call, you could always like um, throw an email to Ivan. I think he'll be uh, much, uh, he'll be happy to answer your questions. And mm -hmm. uh, so now we reach to the end of this presentation. Uh, thanks, Ivan, for the talk. And um, so for next week, we will have another talk uh, on 10th uh, January, like from 4 onwards, uh, on like classical approximating version of quantum machine learning with random proof features by Jonas uh, uh, Lemon. So um, this uh, talk, I think it should be a kind of nice uh, continuation of this talk because it kind of like address some aspect that uh, Ivan mentions in his talk. Um, so I, I think that's all for today's. Uh, if you guys oh, if you guys have any suggestions of the paper that you want uh, us to invite the speaker over to talk about, can always drop us the emails and then to send uh, the link around to people that think might be interested on this like quantum machine learning uh, general talk. Yeah. Thanks everyone and thank Ivan especially for the interesting talk. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you. See you.